Why hello there, welcome back and welcome to a complete change of tack. I thought it might be quite interesting to show you some of the other DIY projects that I do other than just model boats. So in this series, and this is only going to be about two or three episodes long, but in this series I'm going to show you how I've transformed this really lovely lump of olive wood into an epoxy resin coffee table. So without any further ado, we'll crack on. So first things first, I needed to clean up the outside edges of the slab and to do this I've used a crimped wire brush held in my ordinary DeWalt drill. The wire brush is really good for this purpose because it's strong enough, it's abrasive enough that it will remove any dead wood or any bark or anything soft around the outsides of the wood but it's not abrasive enough to really make any impact on the hardened wood underneath so it's really spot on for this purpose. The reason that you need to get rid of this soft stuff is because you want a really firm, solid area for your resin to bond onto. And the danger is, if you leave this soft wood on, and I know it can in some cases be quite attractive if you've got a really nice, pretty bark on the wood or something, but if you leave the soft wood on, you run the risk that that wood might crack off and take the resin with it. Also, please note, I am using eye protection because bits of wood might fly everywhere. You can see besides just the wire brush, I have also used a chisel to get into some of the nooks and crannies that the drill just couldn't quite reach. And the next bit I wanted to show was there were a couple of pieces of wood that had snapped off the slab when I, re I received it in the post. And I wanted to add these bit back on because I thought they looked really cool and once encased in resin, it wouldn't really matter if they were flimsy. So to do this, I use CA glue or uh, super glue uh, along with some CA accelerator to stick everything back on nice and securely. The next job was to start making the mould. So for the mould, for the base, I bought myself a really thin strip of hardboard which had a plastic covering. And for the strong sides, I managed to find a piece of skirting board, which also had a plastic covering on it. For the curved sides, which you'll see in a little bit, I used some more of the really thin hardboard, which was able to bend accordingly. So I've now got my mould built up. Here we are. Um, it's gone okay. The chipboard's split a bit. 
in fact, sorry, the chip board is at its MDF, but um, that's split, but I don't think that'll be a huge problem. I did also run out of melamine board just at the end, and I'm not entirely sure how I managed to cock up the mats, but anyway, I did. Um, it shouldn't be an issue because I'm going to be using mould release tape anyway. So the next job is to add the curvatures in the mould. So for this, I'm using the same hardboard as I used on the base. As you can see, I'm able to achieve curvatures like so. So I just need to pin this in place. So I've now got the mould as I want it. It took quite a long time to get these curves right. Um, there were areas where I wanted sharper curves to sort of really skirt the edge of the wood, you know. Um, and there were areas where I wanted a bit more relief because I wanted to, you know, I wanted to have enough resin to make it noteworthy in the table, like over here as well. Um, and these are pretty solid as well. Um, I know they look quite flimsy, but the reality is they're actually, I'm putting a lot of force on that and it's not budging. You know, they're pretty damn solid. Um, so the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to disassemble this and I'm going to put some tape on everything. Uh, that will stop the epoxy from sticking into the moulds. Apparently this, this white stuff, I think it's called melamine, um, this white stuff is meant to be quite good at resisting epoxy sticking to it. But what I have heard in the past is that epoxy can, uh, as, it, as it cures, it heats. Um, and I've heard that some people have had issues with the um, this white borderline actually melting and then mixing into the epoxy. And I think for the expense of a few rolls of, uh, uh, of uh, mould release tape, I didn't really want to take that risk, you know? So, um, so yeah, that's the next step. So I'm sort of going for a belt and braces approach here. Um, this board is actually not even going to be resisting the resin, but I've still done a bead of silicon and I'll still do a corner bead uh, to absolutely guarantee if I do get any leaks through the curvature um, that this section won't leak out onto the floor. So I've now got two of the sides on. Uh, it becomes a lot easier to build up the mould as you've got more sides on because things become rigid and you've got sort of areas to locate on. You know, you can locate this board 
from the finishing point of this board. Um, again, bead of silicon underneath the board being clamped onto the onto the floor, and I'll do another bead along in the corner. I've got mold release tape here because this is the only part of this board which the uh, which the epoxy will actually stick to. So we'll carry on. So I've got the main bulk of the mould now back together and I'm quite relieved really because I'm sure you can sort of appreciate, you know, these things always never quite fit back together the way that they were originally. Um, so it's great that we've actually got the main structure in place. I'm now going to go along and do beads of silicone along all of these areas. So I didn't film me smoothing down the silicon, um, but I did do it. I know a lot of people use like tools and stuff. I, on this occasion, just used my finger. Um, it seemed to work pretty well. So I've now got a nice bead of silicon all the way around the mold and tape where it needs to be, where it's gonna go, come into contact with the resin. So the next step, once the silicon is dry, is to add the curved boards, which give the mould its final shape. So I've got the first curved area in, and there's a bead of silicon behind this. And later I'm gonna do a bead of silicon along here as well. Of course, there's another bead of silicon behind this. Right, so silicon is on. I've also put it on the bolt, on the, um, the screw heads, and up the walls. Um, so the silicon is on everywhere now. Um, I'm not yet totally convinced that this will be watertight. Uh, there was a little issue here with a bit of tape. So I am thinking of revisiting with some silicon later on. Um, but it's um, it's a start, you know, it's, it's good to start with. So, big news. The mould is ready. You can see there's a few little issues with the tape where it sort of bubbled up a bit uh, just because I've made this into a concave curve. Um, I'm not particularly concerned about that really because I am going to 
reasonably aggressively sand these areas down anyway, so that shouldn't be too much of a problem. But there we are, we are pretty much ready for casting. So the next job to do was to paint a layer of resin around the outsides of the slab of wood. Now there's a few different reasons for doing this. The first is that it seals the wood and this will make sure that any bubbles or air that are inside the wood won't bubble out into the resin during the cure, uh, which could potentially mean that there are trapped bubbles inside your finished pour, which is not really what you want. Uh, the other thing it stops is any sort of particulates or anything that are attached to the wood floating off into the resin and cloudying it up. Um, <clears throat> and the final thing this does is once, I, once this resin has dried, I am going to sand it down with a fairly aggressive sandpaper. And what this will do is it will give me a really nice rough surface for my main cast resin to bond onto, which will guarantee you a really strong bond between the wood and the resin. So, the sealing coat has now dried, as you can see. In a few places, the resin was a little bit proud of the main surface of the wood. And it's really important that before I do my main cast, I sand that down, because it's absolutely vital that the underside, which is the bit I'm sanding now, is absolutely level. Otherwise, I'm going to end up in all sorts of problems after I finish my cast. So in this clip, I am sanding down my underside to make sure it's level, and afterwards I'm going to rough up the sides.
So I've cleaned out my mould um, and I'm now just making sure that it's actually level. So you can see at the moment it's not, uh, and in fact it's not in either direction. So we need to do something to redress this. So by adding wood underneath the workbench we are able to redress the imbalance a little bit and we've got it okay in one dimension as you can see but we're struggling still in our other direction so we still need to do a little bit more work. So we're not far off now but we're still not exactly perfect but we're not far off and you can see when we measure in a few different areas we're sort of we're getting there but we're still not perfect so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get my actual slab because that's gonna really push down on the base and that's gonna give us a much truer reading so here we are again excuse the creaking that's the shed door I've now got my clamps in place so I've got some sash clamps which are clamping over a cross beam down onto the underside of the mould and they're held on with spacer blocks onto the actual slab itself and I've got four on. The real job that these perform is they just stop the wood floating up in the resin because wood is, well most types of wood are buoyant. So the next thing to do now is just to make sure that the level is still correct and if it's not address it. So we've measured up and we are now level. So the next job is to give it one final clean out and then mix up the resin. Right, so we're on to the fairly dreaded mixing of the resin part. Um, my resin requires mixing at a two to one ratio. I'm assuming two parts resin to one part hardener, but I don't really know. Um, so we're gonna do that. This is the really scary bit, if I'm honest. Because this is the bit that's really quite expensive if you get wrong. So the resin I'm using here is called Depoxy 2K700 um, and I did a lot of research into this before settling on a resin and I eventually chose this one. It was uh, available quite uh, swiftly on Amazon. It wasn't very cheap but to be honest after all the research I'd done I haven't really found an inexpensive resin and I suspect that it's probably one of those things that it is probably worth spending a bit of money on because if you get this sort of thing wrong you really can screw up your project and I suspect that because resin is such a popular thing to work with these days there's probably a reasonable number of not very good products on the market so after a lot of research and reading through a lot of reviews I decided on this one It's important to note, on my instructions, it says that this resin is mixed by weight, okay? And that's a really important thing to note because some resins are mixed by volume, not by weight. And that can completely change the maths. So if you're doing a resin project, make absolutely sure that you are mixing using the correct ratios. Now for mixing, I've got one of these, um, it's difficult to see because the camera's so zoomed in, but I've got one of these, um, drill mixing uh, sticks, uh, mainly because everyone else on YouTube seems to use them, but I do think it's a good idea for mixing because you really do need to make sure that you mix your resin appropriately. So the instructions on my resin said to mix between four and five minutes, uh, and so that's what I'm gonna do, and this is another reason why I bought the, uh, the drill stirrer, because I thought it would just take a lot of the effort. Without trying to say I'm lazy, but I probably am a bit lazy. But I thought this would take a little bit of the effort out of the uh, mixing process. Right, so we're about halfway through the mix. Um, and one tip that I have learned while mixing resin is whilst you're mixing to change cups uh, and that sort of guarantees that any any of one part or the other be it the resin or the hardener if anything's got stuck like at the corner of a pot or something by changing the pots over halfway through you're sort of guaranteeing that your 
getting everything in the uh, everything's getting a fair chance to be mixed you see so that is apparently a good technique to guarantee a good mix but I, i'm not in any way um accustomed to doing resin projects this is one of the first i've ever done so this is as newer experience for me as it would be for anyone on a first go little thing I want to do is I want to try to get as many of the bubbles as I can out of this resin. So one of the ideas that people have come up with is to leave your resin in warm water for a while. So I've got some water here, um, it's probably around 40-50 degrees ish. Um, the temperature in my house today is 24, I've just checked the thermostat, so that means that I should have approximately 30 odd minutes to work with this resin before I really need to be getting it in its final state. And as I've only been working with it for five, I've still got plenty of time to do what I can to get bubbles out. see we've pretty much now got the resin perfectly clear. Um, the last thing I'm going to do before I take it down and actually pour it is give it a squirt of isopropyl alcohol because that lowers your surface tension and can pop any bubbles on the surface. So here we are. And there you go we are. We've got very very few bubbles in there so I'm pretty happy with that actually. That's the first pour done, and I think I've done the sort of classic overreaction. See, I was so concerned about exceeding my maximum pour limit, which on this type of resin is only a centimetre, so it's not a lot. Um, but I was so concerned about exceeding that limit that what I've actually gone and done is I've mixed nowhere near enough resin, and so I think I've probably only actually poured about... Ugh, to know three four millimeters something like that so um it's all a learning curve isn't it but it just means that in the next pour i do i'm gonna have to mix up a lot more resin so here we are with pour number two
here we are after pour two. You can see what sort of level we're up to. We're about ooh, just under halfway, I would say, up the slab of wood. So I'll leave this for another 24 hours and come back to it. We're about two hours into the um, the second pour. Ooh, ice cream van. Sorry, I uh, got distracted. I could hear the ice cream van siren. So anyway, um, we're, <laughs> we're about two hours into the pour now. Um, this is pour number two. And you can see everything so far looks okay. It looks a bit yellowy, but this resin does look yellow until it's fully cured. And that's because of the, um, there is some UV particulates, which are designed to absorb UV. Um, which, ironically, eventually will stop the resin being yellow once it's fully cured. So it's, um, that's perfectly natural for now. There are some sort of surface occlusions. You can see one there. Um, that's where I've sprayed my isopropyl alcohol, and that leaves a slight sort of film on the surface. There's, an, there's another bit down there you can just see. Again, perfectly normal. So far, um, you, can, you can feel the heat on it. It generates a hell of a lot of heat when it's curing. Um, but so far, uh, nothing majorly untoward to report. My main concern is if I've poured too thick a layer, um, because the resin generates so much heat when it's curing, if the layer's too thick, um, the heat won't be able to escape from the resin and it will, it'll shatter like glass. Um, and obviously that'll completely ruin the project and I'll have to start from scratch again. So that's my main concern, I guess. Uh, so um, I guess see what happens in 24 hours. So that's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like and maybe subscribe. Um, if you do have any questions on anything, whack them down below in the comments and I will try to get back to you. And I shall see you in the next one. Bye for now.